Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for coming on such short notice. What's the deal, boss man? I was just about to receive my Christmas gift when you called me over. Christmas gift? I wouldn't expect a Jew to understand about that sort of thing. You see, Ben, Christmas is a time of year where people give each other presents. I know what Christmas is. I meant, isn't it a bit early to be unwrapping presents? There's still some time before the big day. I never said she was a present, but she was definitely a gift, along with a $500 bottle of whiskey. It was going to be a very merry day for big boy Trump. That's the name I told her to call me. Nothing says Christmas like hookers and booze. This guy gets it. I need to work on my sarcasm. Anyways, what did you want to see us about, Dungeon Master? Gentlemen, as it is the time of year for festivities, I have invited you all to take part in my homebrew Christmas one-shot. I have prepared for each of you a character to use and will host a festive game for you all to enjoy. Yay, more Dungeons and Dragons. Sounds like fun. I'm interested in what characters you provided for us. Count me in. Mercedes can wait. It's time for some dice rolling. Excellent. Then without further delay, here are your character sheets. You'll be level three for this one shot. Please introduce yourselves. I am Dementia, fearless tiefling barbarian. Nothing scares me for I have the devil's blood running through my veins. I am Emot Tianles, human paladin, deliverer of truth and justice, but not my truth, only the one that matters, the truth. I am Drone Estrike, half-orc ranger. With my sharp eyes and brutal strength, I can hit any target I set my sights on and to hell with anyone who's within the vicinity of my attacks. It's your turn, Donald. This is a fucking joke, right? A joke? Yeah, like you got my real character sheet in your pocket or something and you handed me a fake one for a reaction. You can't be seriously expecting me to play this. What is it? I'm not saying, I'm right though, right? This isn't really my character sheet. That is in fact your character sheet, Donald. If you don't wish to take part, that's fine. You may leave, but maybe just for this one shot, you could try it out. You might find you enjoy it. Fuck's sake. Fine, I am arrogant. A fairy sorcerer, I am tiny with cute wings and a boyish face, but my looks are deceiving as I wield magnificent and deadly magic. This is such bullshit. That's adorable. I can put you in my pocket if you get tired and need a nap. I'm gonna give it so many cuddles. Seriously, all of you can go fuck yourselves. Now that we have introductions out of the way, we can begin. You are part of a guild that is frequently sought after for various quests. Be it small or large, mundane or dangerous, nothing is turned away providing the price is right. Last night your guild received a letter from a village in the far north region of the world. A village known for its manufacturing and delivery of toys across the plain each and every winter solstice since the founder first created the company. Every year they hold a festival in honor of said founder, Mr. Kringle. However, the letter states that he has canceled the event as the village has been under a curse. Every night for the last week a child has disappeared. In its place sits a dark stone. Mr. Kringle has begun shutting down production of the factory and everyone is in distress as they cannot stop the children from vanishing. They beg the help of your guild to which your leaders summon the four of you. You are handed each a potion of healing and some instructions. Find out who or what is taking the children. Locate and save them if they're still alive and take out the culprit. One by one, you step into a teleportation circle and within an instant, you find yourselves on the edge of the village a snow-capped and very beautiful looking area surrounded by mountains. It is midday, the sun shines brightly and the cold is bitter. The village has no decorations and all is quiet. I take a deep breath and sigh with relief. I say to myself, this is your chance to make a name for yourself and show the guild they made the right choice in choosing you to lead. Don't mess this up, Imat. Then turn to the others, looking from one to the other. Okay, troops, I have been assigned to lead this team. We are here to investigate a curse, as the letter states, that is taking the children each night. We haven't worked with each other before, but I know if we put our heads together, we can accomplish anything. Who's with me? And I, I put my fist out to the others. I shake my head and put my hand over my face. I should have just taken the easier choice and let the guild behead me. Death would have been kinder than putting up with this pathetic moment. I stand with my arms crossed and a sour look on my face. I didn't join to be part of your happy-go-lucky gang. I wanted excitement and danger, not this cheerleading trash. Hey, what did you do to my voice? 
I tweaked it a little, as you're a fairy after all. You really want me to hate you? Whatever, this is the last time I do a one-shot with pre-made characters. I flap my wings and hover off the ground as I wouldn't like the cold floor. Why would the guild team us up anyways? I eye up the half-orc and tiefling. Not exactly top-tier material here. I must be here to balance out the rejects. Do you always speak this much? I may have to fix that. And I brandish one of my short swords. I'll make it quick, just one swing, and that tongue will find a new home on the frozen ground. I smile a most wicked smile at the half-orc, raise a finger to my lips and say, sleep, now pointing it at him. I'm gonna need you to roll five d8s for that to work. Drone sways on the spot and falls backwards, completely unconscious. Okay, I'm starting to see the appeal of this character. I continue hovering and begin to giggle. I lower my fist, looking disappointingly at the team I have. I walk over to Drone, crouching down by his head. I lift him by the shoulders and headbutt him. Your action has awoken Drone from the spell's effect. Who would have felt a throb of pain in the process? Ow, what the hell happened? I put our heads together. That's what you meant, right? I look eagerly to Emut. Not exactly, no. Oh, should I do it again harder? Yes, and a thousand times more. I am now cackling with laughter and begin whizzing around with glee. You try that again and I'll cut those horns off and shove them right up your... Enough! I draw my own sword now. We have been sent here on a mission and we must stop this nonsense at once. Arrow, any more shenanigans from you and you will be banned from the guild, so no more chance for the excitement you seek. Drone, I have been granted the power to uphold your alternative option. So, if you really wish for death, I shall give it to you. Demon, you. Well, try not to take what I say so literally in future, okay? I lower my sword, glancing at Emmett's. As much as I would like to see you try, I am not ready for my journey's end just yet. I stop whizzing around and pull a face, crossing my arms again. I was just trying to have some fun. We haven't done anything yet, and this village looks boring. This village is having trouble, and we're here to find out exactly what's been happening to the children. We should locate the person who sent the guild the note. The four of you walk into the town. There are no villagers to be seen, no festive music, no decorations for the time of year. It's like a ghost town. Isn't this place meant to be lively and full of fun? And what, a few children go missing and suddenly it's the end of the world? You're not from this plain arrow, so perhaps this may come as a surprise to you, but it's a big deal when even one child is missing. According to the letter, several have gone. The people here are most likely grief-stricken, and if there are more children here, the parents are probably terrified it'll happen to them too. They probably just left to venture out into the harsh world and live their lives. I did when I was young and I've never looked back. Humans and half-orcs parenting styles are slightly different, Drone. Parents tend to love their children and aren't eager to allow them to leave at such young ages. I was left as a baby for the guild to raise. Yeah, but you're ugly as fuck. I would have left you too with a face like that. There's someone that looks like me? Who is this fuck that you speak of that my face is as ugly as? I like this one. We are going to have some fun. Uh, gentlemen, I'd like you all to roll perception checks. Everyone apart from Demon begin noticing that you are being watched. From each house you pass, you see curtains twitching as the residents peek at you from within their homes. You said we need to find the one who sent the letter, right? And I zoom towards the nearest house and knock on it several times. Hey, we know you're in there. Did you send us a letter about your dead children? Arrow! What? You don't go asking questions like that! Are the children dead? I thought they were venturing off into the harsh world. No, I mean, I don't know if they're... But that's not the point! Step aside, Arrow! And I rush towards the door and gently knock. Pardon my companion here. He is not diplomatic. My name is Emot Tionlis. We were sent on behalf of the Guild of Many Tings in response to a letter sent by someone in this village. There were reports of missing children and we've come to investigate the situation. You hear some shuffling coming from behind the door. It swings open and an elf is standing on the other side. He looks quite young and slightly scared at your group. You're here from the Guild? That's correct. Do you know where we can find the one who sent us this? They didn't sign it, you see, so we're not sure who to report to. I show him the note. The elf takes it in his hand and looks closely. After a moment, he looks up. That looks like Mayor Tinsel's handwriting. You can find him over at that house. He points to a house at the end of the street, which is slightly larger than the others. He's in a meeting with Mr. Kringle at the moment. Thank you, Mr. Applesmith. And he hands you back the note. 
Now, if you please, I must be with my family. We are in mourning. And he closes the door without the chance for you to say anything. Elves are weird people. It's not morning. It's at least midday. That's not what he... Never mind. Let's get over to the mayor's house. I roll up the note and put it away, and as we start walking again, I say to Arrow, no more knocking on people's doors unless I say so. That was most likely a family that lost their child. We can't have you saying the things you said. So no fun and no talking to people. You're even more boring than the half-orc. And I pull another face. You walk on until you reach the larger house at the end of the street. Standing outside, you can hear two voices conversing with each other, sounding a little raised. I think we should eavesdrop on what they're saying. That's a good idea. If they're arguing about something, they're not likely to tell us what about. Might get us information they wouldn't want us to know. That seems a bit deceiving. We're meant to be here to help. I don't see why we should be sneaking around at this point as we've got no reason to suspect anything from the mayor. When the DM gives you a line like that, you don't pass up on it. You roll your dollar bill and snort that shit up. That reminds me of a party me and Barack went to. We don't need to be discussing things outside the game, Joe. So who's going to attempt to sneak up and listen in? Isn't it obvious? Look at those stats. I'm going to carefully fly up to the door and press my ear up against it to listen in. There's no way my character would allow for this to happen. If you try to do this, I will run and bang on the door. That's a good point. What if I were to distract your character somehow? Then Arrow would have no problem listening in. What kind of distraction? I could start a fight with Demon. He could say something stupid that Drawn would get offended at, and then Emot would be busy trying to break us up. I guess that could work. I still don't like this, though. Could your character say something offensive yet stupid for us, Joe? I could try, but it's, it's hard to come up with something like that. I haven't really got the experience for it. Seriously? Nah, I'm just fucking with you. I've got you covered, homie. Don't call me that. Okay, so Demon will say something that offends Drone, who will then begin brawling with the tiefling. This causes Emot to be distracted as he tries to calm the situation down, leaving Arrow free to sneak up to the door and listen in on the conversation. Do I have that correct? Sounds right to me. Okay, Joe, let's have it. You were a terrible president and an even worse friend. I think I just creamed myself. No, you asshole. You were meant to say something about my character in character. Oh, right, yeah, sorry. As I walk alongside Drone, I say to him, I heard you tried to kill the president of our guild, but failed, and that's why you're with us now. You know he's like 200 years old and a turtle, right? Are you really weak or just clumsy? I'll show you how strong I am when I take those fucking horns off your head. And I lunge at him. I see this fight break out and try to put a stop to it. I use this opportunity to listen in on the conversation at the door. Roll me a stealth check. Ah, you are successful. With Emot being preoccupied with the other two fighting, you listen in at the door with your ear pressed up against it. There are indeed two voices, both arguing with each. But with the now combined noise of your companions brawling, you can only make out a few words. This must stop! before you hear the sounds of footsteps approaching and the door swings open. Standing before you is another elf. He looks shocked to see a fairy at his door and then his eyes fall on the half-orc and tiefling fighting with a human attempting to get in between them. Cease your actions at once. I would be ignoring this and continue hitting the tiefling. Same here. There's no way Demon would give up first. I would pull myself away from this fight and splutter apologies to the elf, constantly bowing and I would have flown away from the door, picked up some snow, balled it up, and start pelting the two, making them more angry. He said your mother looked like a pig's anus. A rumbling can be heard from within the house, and something large and red hurls out of the open doorway. It lands between the two, and in a blink of an eye, you're both knocked flying. But before either of you hit the floor, you find yourself pulled forward and embraced in a large red blur. Looking up, you see a rosy-cheeked face, a pair of glasses, a massive white beard, and a joyous smile as an extremely large man in a red furry suit is hugging you both. Ho, 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 ho! What is going on here? This is the season to be jolly. There shouldn't be any fighting. Not while I am around. Ho, 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 ho! That is going to be quite enough. 
I try to remove myself from this guy's embrace. I'm not familiar with such warm hugging, and I remain still. Barack, give me a strength check. Even with your impressive strength, you are unable to get out of this man's grasp. Let me go, this is ridiculous. Are you two going to behave yourselves? Do I have a promise? Yes, I promise, now let me fucking go. Instantly, he lets go and you fall backwards, catching yourself from falling over. I would have not realized at first and would actually be holding on to the guy for a moment, enjoying a hug. Then I do realize and quickly let go. The elf looks around at you all. Just what are you doing in our village? I hurry forward and pull out the note. Sir, I am Emot Tianles, leader of this team and emissary of the Guild of Many Things. We are here in response to this letter that I'm informed is in your handwriting. If you would, please confirm for me if this was indeed you, and if so, sit with us as we discuss the subject of the letter. He takes it from you and examines it. He stares at it for a moment before glancing at the man in red. Yes, indeed, this was me. My apologies. In my haste to contact the guild, I forgot to sign it. So, they sent their best and brightest, I see. His eyes fall on the half-orc, looking menacingly at the tiefling, who returns a look of disgust, then onto the fairy flying around with a few snowballs still in his hands. How fortunate for us. I am Mayor Tinsel. I look over this village's affairs, as well as the treasurer for the Kringle Delivery Service. And this, he gestures to the man in red, is Mr. I am Mr. Kringle. I am the founder and lead manufacturer at my factory. Have you all been good this year? He doesn't wait for your response. I'm sure you have. Does he think we're children? Shh, don't say anything or we may not get a present. Mr. Kringle, we have urgent matters to discuss with you and Mayor Tinsel. We've been sent here to help find out what has happened to the missing children. Excellent. Then let us get inside. It is frightfully cold out here. <laughs> Won't you agree, Mayor? Hmm. The mayor was looking at the letter. Oh yes, quite. Please come inside. And he gestures you in. He takes you along a stone corridor and into a large dining room. A long table, comfy armchairs, and a crackling fireplace fill the room. You instantly feel the warmth spread through your bodies. Decorations are placed all around, and there is a large tree in the corner with what, at first glance, looks like a star. But then you notice how it is actually a star-shaped fairy. What the actual fuck? You people hang fairies on trees. Do you even know how offensive that is? Oh, really? I am terribly sorry. I shall take it down at once. Just fucking with you. Leave it up there. It's where fairies belong, looking down at everyone else. I give Arrow a disapproving look and clear my throat. Mr. Tinsel, may we please get to the matter at hand? Yes, of course. Everyone, please be seated. Gotta say, boss man, these maps look dope as fuck. Thank you, but I can't take credit for them. Somebody far more talented made this and others. Now you all take your place around the table. Before we begin, let us have a meal together, Mr. Kringle, if you would be so kind. Mr. Kringle chuckles and taps his nose. A moment later, a delicious selection of food and drink forms on the table. Cinnamon rolls, gingerbread cookies, a pot of mulled wine, and the fattest turkey you've ever seen. The aroma of the combined food makes your mouth water. The mayor takes a goblet, several now appearing next to him, and fills it up, passing it along. Once everyone has one in their hands, he raises his own and stands. Welcome, members of the Guild of Many Tings, for coming to us in our time of need. And he drinks. I will also stand up and raise a goblet. Thank you for considering our guild to help with your request. We will do everything we can to resolve this problem. I look at the others to encourage them to stand with me. I'll immediately stand up and thrust my goblet high in the air. We will avenge the dead children. Just point us to the bastard that did it. Demon, we don't know that for sure. But that's what Arrow said. I begin grinning and float up with my goblet. I take back what I said earlier. I think I will enjoy my stay here. I'll continue to sit in my chair, pushing the goblet away. I, I, I don't drink this piss. Let's get to the point of what's going on already. Please forgive my companions. They were not the guild's first choice. Neither were you, Mr. Inappropriate Erection. How do you... I got into the personnel files and saw the reports. Tisk tisk, Mr. Chinless, what a way to get demoted. And I drained my goblet in one. This is not the time for that. Funny. 
That's what the guild's president's daughter said at the award ceremony. Oh, you're that paladin? I heard all about it. What an embarrassing situation to be in. Yes, well, that was then. Right now, we have more pressing matters. Mr. Tinsel, Mr. Kringle, despite what you have seen and heard so far, believe me when I say we will put a stop to what has been happening here. The mayor is still standing, with his mouth partially open, a look of disbelief on his face. He straightens up and clears his throat. I'm sure you believe that Mr. Erection, I mean Mr. Chunless, but I'm not so sure. I know we don't look like a capable team, and yes, this is our first mission as a team, but I assure you. The mayor holds up a hand. Let me explain what has been happening here. His face becomes stiff, and although it didn't physically change, you feel as if he aged 30 years, about a week ago. The first child was taken 12 years old. The family awoke in the morning to find her gone. We searched the whole of the village and further for two days, but to no avail. Then, a second child went missing the next night, 10 years old, and a third, the night after that, 11. It has been quiet for the last few days. We closed down the factory and sent everyone home to be with their children. Your letter said something about a stone in place of the child. Yes, I have them here. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out three jet black stones, slightly powdery and matted. He places them on the table and you can see black markings on his hand. Can we examine the stone? Yes, there are three, so I'll allow three of you to check one each. I have the lowest intelligence, so I'll sit this out. Plus, my character wouldn't care to know about it. It takes a big man to admit he has no intelligence. Bravo. Fuck you, Donald. The mayor hands a stone to Emot, Demon, and Arrow. Demon works out instantly what it is, but Arrow and Emot take a little longer. The stones are, in fact, lumps of coal. I give mine a sniff. Classic Brandon. Joe, you also notice something else, which the others would not have due to your sniffing. You get a mixture of two smells, one being classic coal, the other of excrement. It's coal. I hold it up in the light. It's shit. Hard to tell what the quality is like without burning it. No, I mean, it is literally a piece of shit. I drop it instantly. Same here, and I want to try to wipe my hands on Demen without him noticing. I'll need a sleight of hand check. Remind me what your passive perception is, Joe. Eleven. I would have leaned over to Demen and pretended to show interest in his discovery while wiping the coal shit onto him. Wow! You worked that out with just your nose. You're very talented, friend. You're too fixated on the lump of soiled coal to notice Arrow carefully wiping his hands on your clothing and shoulder pads. So you're saying these are shits that also double up as coal? I lean forward, but don't touch any of them. And these were found where? Where each child was last seen, in their bedrooms. Do any of these homes have fireplaces? Yes, each one. And before you ask, yes, they have their own coal. But we spoke with the parents of each household and they confirmed that none of the children ever kept them in their rooms. Well, if something did indeed shit these out, then I should be able to track whatever it was. Is this why you believe something took the children? They didn't leave on their own accord? Yes, we do. But it is still confusing us because the windows and doors were locked from the inside. One of the parents thought they saw something on the night the third child was taken, but they're in such a state it's been difficult to get an answer from them. Then we should start our investigation at these houses. Perhaps we will find some clues, and if not, at least we can ask about what the parents thought they saw. Might give us an idea of what we may be dealing with. Arrow, have you ever heard of such a creature? What do you say, boss man? Do I know about this type of thing? Roll me a history check. Something about what you've heard seems familiar, but you can't place your finger on it at the moment. Perhaps more information will help. A word comes to mind, however, naughty. Can't say I've ever taken an interest in what fey creatures shit, but there is something that is floating around in my head the more I think about it. Tell me, were the children good kids or assholes? There is no such thing as a bad child. Not as far as I'm concerned. Why would you ask that? The mayor looks taken aback by your question. I've got the word naughty in my head. So either the kids aren't very well behaved or I'm just drunk off my ass and feeling kinky seeing that fairy doll on that tree. Fuck knows. You've only had one goblet of mulled wine. And look at the size of me. And I give a small hiccup. I think we have enough to go to start investigating. Thank you both for sitting down with us. 
We shall do everything we can to find these children and bring them home safely. Mr. Kringle stands up and shakes all of your hands, his face beaming with joy. This might mean that the Solstice is saved. I am going to return to the factory and continue production in the hopes... No, not in the hopes. Knowing that our children are going to be saved by these fine guild members. Good luck to you all. <laughs> he nods to the mayor and leaves the house. The mayor also stands and bows low to him as he passes. Once Mr. Kringle has left, he straightens up and smiles at the rest of you. Good luck with your investigation, members of the Guild of Many Tings. Should you need to ask me any more questions, I will be in my office. And he bows to each of you and makes his way to a door behind Demon. We have some information to work with. Three kids taken from seemingly locked homes each time at night. A lump of coal left in their place, which is also shit. And one of the parents thought they saw something on the third taking. Let's start with going to the house of the third child. Is that what you all agree on? Might as well start there. If we can work out what type of creature this is, I could potentially track it to its current hideout. Then I could kick the shit out of it. Pun intended? Who's pun? Never mind, let's go already. I'm starting to sober up. Hold on. I stick my head into the office. Mr. Tinsel, do you have a map that you can show me where the three houses are? Of course. He opens a drawer in his desk and pulls out a piece of parchment. He unrolls it and shows it to you. We are currently here. The first child came from this house, the second from this one, and the third from this one here. He hands it over to you. Excellent, thank you. I roll up the parchment, bow to Mr. Tinsel, and head out the house, beckoning the others to follow. You all leave without another word and make your way to the third child's home. You are currently standing outside the front door. I'm going to drift towards it and- Hold up. Now what? Let my character do the talking. Yours will probably say something inconsiderate and will cause us trouble. You're right, Ben. You're clearly the leader of this group and your opinions should be respected. Really? Thanks, Donald. I walk up to- Fuck you, I bang on the door. Asshole. You only have yourself to blame for that one. Even I saw that coming. The door opens, revealing an elderly elf woman. She has a kind face and greets you with a smile. Oh, what a beautiful fairy. We have been blessed by a fey wonder. What's up, Granny? We're here about your missing kid and to find out what you saw when it was taken. Her smile falls from her face and tears begin to form. Please come in. My husband was the one who saw something. She walks you into her home. An elderly elf man is sitting in a chair, staring into the fire. Orist. Some people have come to ask us about our Ondroth's kidnapping. The man doesn't look away from the fire. She turns to you. He hasn't said a word since he saw whatever it was that took our child. Please do what you can. I've got this, guys. I fly over to the old fella and hover in front of him. Hey, we're here to find your kid. Snap out of it and let us know what took it. Roll me a persuasion check. The elderly elf does not react or respond. He simply stares into the fire. We did our best, guys. Let's bounce. Not so fast. I'm going to try next. I'll walk over and kneel down beside him. Good, sir. We know you are worried for your child's safety. That is why we are here. We will find them, but we need your help in order to do so. If you could tell us what you know, it will help move things along. Roll me a persuasion check. Damn it. Your words have even less impact on the elf. He doesn't seem to have noticed you at all. Do you two want to try? I walk up to the elf lady instead. Is there anything you can tell us about the night your child was taken? There wasn't anything too different about that night. Two had already gone, and so we made sure the house was locked up tight. There was no way anyone could get in. She stood staring at her husband for a moment. But there was something strange. It got very cold. You live in a snow-covered village surrounded by mountains. Why is it strange it was cold? Isn't it normally? Well, yes, of course, dearie, but that night it was extremely cold. Now that I think about it, I don't think the fireplace was burning anything, which is odd as we tend to keep it burning through most of the night. But on the nights the other children were taken, I remember thinking how cold it was then as well. An unusual bitterness in the air. Dungeon Master. Dron would be staying in the back just watching what's going on and what's being said. Can he tell what the old man is looking at exactly? 
The way he seems fixated on the fireplace and what the old lady just said makes me think there's more to this. Roll me a perception check. You perceive that the old man is staring at something in particular on the edge of the fireplace. I walk over and examine what it is. Roll an investigation check. You can see in the soot that layers the outer edge of the fireplace, a clear print. It is a curved line, like a large letter U. Guys, I found something. It kind of looks like a hoof print. I quickly look at the old man and see if he reacts to that. He shifts in his chair and glances at you, his eyes widening with fear. You know what left this here, don't you? He slowly nods his head. Describe it to us. He begins to breathe rapidly, as if recounting the memory is causing him great anxiety. If you don't tell us what this thing is, we won't be able to save your child. You may as well come to peace with it now and give up. The lady cries into her hands. The sound seems to have had an effect on the man and he sits up in his chair. He takes a deep breath. On that night, I woke up due to the intense cold. I figured the fire had gone out, so I got dressed and went into the room to add some more wood. It was so dark I couldn't see anything at first, but I heard something, a strange clip clop noise, like that of a horse, but a sort of scraping noise as well, like it was dragging itself. There was a growl and I froze where I stood. Then suddenly I heard my son's voice. It was muffled, but I heard him. I lit a candle and saw a wicked looking creature. It must have been eight feet tall with several horns on its head, gray skin with markings all over its body, a large black beard and bright red eyes. It was holding a bag and I knew my son must have been in there. I pleaded with it not to take my boy and it, it spoke. It said a word in a growl to me before it turned on the spot right where that print is and vanished. What was the word it spoke? It said, naughty. There's that word again. Hey, old man, was your kid well behaved? He looks shocked at your question. Of course he was. What sort of question is that to ask? Can I see if he was lying? By all means, roll me an insight check. You can tell he is not being entirely truthful on the matter. Don't sugarcoat this old man. We're trying to help you. Your son was a bad kid, wasn't he? Admit it. He, he just, what has that got to do with anything? Dungeon Master, given the new information we've obtained, can I re-roll for history? Go ahead. With this new knowledge of the description of the creature, the cold weather, and the insight into the child's behavior, you have a solid idea of what you're up against. I shall pass you a note with some information. I continue to hover in front of the old man. It has everything to do with what's been happening. Your child has attracted a monstrosity from another plane that enjoys feasting on badly behaved younglings. Although it was considered merely a myth in my world, a tale to scare the young from stepping out of line. But it doesn't explain how this beast came to be here. Upon hearing the words feasting, the elderly couple begin wailing in terror. Please, no, don't tell us our boy is already dead. He could well be by this point. However, there is a slight chance it could be fattening them up first before it feasts, which means we still have some time. Then we have no time to waste. Let us move on to the next house with haste. I bow to the elderly couple. We will do everything we can to return your child safely to you. And so you make your way over to the next house. A man opens the door as you approach. I saw you coming up the road. You're here about our missing girl, right? Come in. Yes, indeed we are good, sir. How did you know that? The mayor, although useless for the most part, knows how to get word spread about. We've got the couple from the other house here as well. Save you a trip. That's great, but we did want to check out the house for any potential clues. A younger looking elf speaks up. I already tore that place apart trying to find something to get me back to my boy. All I found was a lump of strange looking coal and a tuft of black curly hair. Name's Seamus, by the way. And this here is my wife, Muriel. Mayor says you fellas are from the Guild of Many Tings. Is that true or is the sack of crap talking shit again? They don't seem to hold the mayor in high regards. That could just be because he hasn't been able to find their children, but let's ask. He is correct. We are from the Guild and have been assigned to locate your children. I do have a couple questions for you, if you please. Firstly, you say you found some black hair. Do you have it on you? He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a small wad of black curly hair. He hands it over to you. I pass this to Drone. What can you tell from this? Nature check, please. It doesn't belong to any type of beast that's native to this world. Its texture is similar to a goat's, 
and yet there's something off by it, almost like it's manufactured and yet authentic at the same time. So it seems that it may be the same creature that took the third child. Hmm, my second question, and please forgive me if this seems like a strange one, but were your children ever considered naughty? What the hell? What do you mean naughty? You trying to imply they were bad kids? We have a theory, and it would help if you let us know the facts. Oh, you want facts, do you? Here's a few for you. Our kids were always well behaved, so was the other one who was taken. They never stepped out of line and always did what they were told. You want to accuse someone of being bad? Then look no further than the damn mayor. Seamus, please. No, I'm not having anyone thinking badly of these kids just because they followed him that one time. They're curious is all and not nosy little twerps as that asshole claimed. Can you please elaborate? The elf lady Moriel steps forward. A few weeks ago, the mayor was seen heading up a mountain path. We've been told not to head up there as it can be quite dangerous conditions. But the children followed him anyway. They told us he caught them after they saw him come out of a cave and he gave them quite the scolding, calling them nosy and badly behaved. Now that I think about it, he did call them naughty as well. Seamus and the other dads got quite angry with the mayor and haven't forgiven him. They think that because it's these three children in particular, the mayor hasn't done everything to have them found. Guys, I think the mayor may be our bad guy in all this. It's not looking too good for him, sure, but I think we need to get some concrete evidence before we act on that. We should check out this cave they mentioned. Maybe he's been stealing the children and taking them to his evil cave lair. But that doesn't make sense. If the mayor was behind this, why did he send the letter to the guild? I can't give you all the answers, Barack. Sometimes you gotta work it out for yourself. Let's finish asking the questions. Then we can leave and go over the information we know. I'll ask about the cave as well. Okay, we'll come back to the mayor in a moment. I have a couple more questions regarding the night your children were taken. Were the doors and windows locked? Was the fireplace burning? What was the weather like on the nights they were taken? And did you see or hear anything on the night? The man who let you in stroked his chin before answering. Yes, we always lock our doors and windows every night. Our fireplace, as far as we know, was still burning, but barely. I remember those particular nights the weather was horribly colder than usual, and no, I didn't see or hear anything. The other man nods along. Same here. I see. Okay, one final question, and we'll leave you in peace. Can you tell us where we can find this cave your children saw the mayor came out of? Did the mayor have something to do with our missing children? I knew it! I'll kill him! I frantically attempt to calm them all down. No, no, no! We're looking at all possible leads at the moment. There is no reason to suspect him. Please, do not do anything rash. Roll me a persuasion check. Your words manage to calm them down. The elf lady at the back steps forward. I'll show you the path they took to the cave. Please come with me. And she leads you outside the house and along the streets until you reach the edge of the village. Up ahead, you can see a long, winding path that snakes its way into one of the mountains. If you follow this path until you reach a fork, take the left, and the cave is some distance in that direction. She smiles and walks back the way she came. Thanks, old lady. We'll do our best to find your dead kids. Damn it, Demon. Okay, troops. While we make our way to this cave, let's go over what we know so far. Three kids have been taken within the last week, probably dead, maybe by way of feasting. The mayor is suspect number one who's in cahoots with some demon monster and he brought them here to his cave of death to do all kinds of evil things. That was just so wrong. Hardly anything you said was factual. Just be quiet and take lead, will you? I'll start off with some actual facts. There have been three children that have gone missing within the last week, and only three, each from a house that the parents say were locked from the inside. On the nights these children vanished, the weather was reported to have been much colder than usual. The fireplaces were reported to have been low, if not out completely on these nights. Only one person has claimed to have seen anything. We have found a footprint that resembles a hoof, a tuft of black curly hair, and a description of some kind of beast that's approximately eight feet tall with horns, gray skin, markings over its body and red eyes. The hair we were given has a strange texture to it. It does not belong to any type of creature that I'm aware of that would come from this world, which would suggest it came from somewhere else, perhaps another plane. The lumps of coal that were found in the houses were also pieces of shit. That suggests that this creature defecated either during or after the kidnapping. The fact that the houses were locked lead me to think this creature has magical abilities, such as teleportation. 
or that it used the fireplaces for entry, although that has not been proven. It also carried with it a sack that it used to hold the children in. It said the word naughty to the old man who saw it. And I think this creature has indeed come from another plane, mine. But that's where this gets really strange. Back in my world, there is a tale of a creature who seeks out badly behaved kids. He would appear in your home and bring terrible weather with him. He would throw them into his sack and shit in your home as a reminder of what was taken, a piece of shit. Afterwards, he would take them to his dwelling and fatten them up to feast on when he pleased. But that's just a story. There isn't anything that actually resembles this creature in reality. I think this must be someone who heard of the tale and is just trying to use that as a cover story to mask their evil deeds. The parents mentioned how the mayor called those kids naughty for following him to this cave. Does this creature respond to kids being called that? Is that how it knows what's considered naughty? Maybe. It's been a long time since I heard these tales, so I don't remember how this was supposed to work. But it doesn't matter because it's not real. How far are we from the cave dungeon master? You're just about to approach the fork in the path. You take the left, as the lady instructed, and continue walking on. After a little while, you find yourself outside a cave entrance. Inside it is rather small, and there are only a couple of things in here. One is a makeshift tent with slash markings over it, and another is a strange platform. It has several markings on it, and looks as if it has recently been disturbed. What the fuck has been going on here? Can we investigate this? You can either roll for investigation or arcana. I'll investigate. I'll do arcana. Demen. You find that there are deep scratches on the platform as if something pulled itself along it with deep hoof prints also notable. Arrow, you can sense the presence of summoning magic and that it was pulling something from the shadow fell. Would I know what the shadow fell is? Roll me a history check. Hey, Nat 20, baby, let's go. Yes. You are fully aware of the plane of the shadow fell and the fact that you now know where this creature comes from fills you with fear as it confirms that it is indeed real. The fact it was a tale in your world is because this type of creature had never set foot in yours. So you had no problem believing it didn't exist. Oh shit, guys, this thing is 100% legitimate. Oh fuck, someone actually summoned this thing here. It's a good thing we're here to stop it then. You seem scared, Arrow. Of course I am. Do you know how old I am? I'm only 30. That's practically a child to this creature. It might try to fucking eat me. You may be our key to luring this thing out then. If we set you up as bait, we could take it out. Well, wait a minute. No one is setting me up as bait. We can try another way. I agree, Demon. It sounds a bit risky to set this up. If we do some more investigation, perhaps we will find an alternative way of finding this creature. We could speak with the mayor. He might have been the one who summoned this thing. Can't we at least try my idea first? No, we can't, but out of curiosity, how are you going to attempt to lure out this creature? Arrow, you're being naughty. You're still a youngling, and you're being very naughty today. You'd see the color drain from Arrow's face. Just what the fuck do you think you're doing? He asked you, now would you have done it? Not a fucking demonstration. Sorry, but I really wanted to see if it worked. When those parents said the mayor called the kids naughty, and that creature used that word as well, I figured if you call a kid that, Maybe that is enough to get its attention. D-Men, we really need you to think these things through in future. Everyone, roll me a perception check. Are you fucking kidding me? Only Drone has noticed the temperature has begun to significantly drop. Something's happening, and I prepare my longbow, looking outside the cave. At these words, the rest of you now notice the cold, but do not have time to react. All around you goes dark. You hear a low growl. Drone and D-Men. Having dark vision, you can still see. A very tall creature with protruding horns and glowing red eyes stands on top of the summoning platform. It holds a large sack in one hand and it begins to walk forwards to where Arrow is. Fuck! Roll for initiative! You really screwed the pooch with this one, Joe. Come on, man. We'll be fine. Easy for you to say. That monster has its eyes set on me, and neither I or Ben can see a goddamn thing. 
I suggest that you all work as a team to ensure you come out of this encounter alive. Ben, you're up first. Can you do something about that creature going for arrow? Let me see. Er, yes, I've got something. First, I use an action to light a torch. Then I'll move 30 feet across towards Arrow. And finally, I'll cast Sanctuary on him as a bonus action. Should the creature attempt to attack him, it'll need to make a wisdom saving throw first. If it fails, it either chooses a new target or loses that attack. Nicely played, Shapiro. I take aim at the creature and attack with my longbow. Your arrow finds its target and lands in the creature's shoulder. It howls in pain. At least we know now that it can feel pain. Good, then I will move myself up 20 feet and end my turn. The creature whose initial target was Arrow now slowly turns on the spot and looks at Drone. It growls menacingly. It reaches behind itself and you hear an unpleasant sound. A moment later, it holds a lump of coal in its hand. That's so gross. It hurls the lump at you, but you manage to dodge it. So it tries again and this time is successful. The coal hits you across your forehead and you feel an instant burning as you take seven fire damage. It then moves next to Arrow and ends its turn. Drum, you okay? I'll live. Go and kick the shit out of him. Imat, hey, can I do the thing? Do it! I grip my great axe and tense my body. You see the fires of hell erupt around me. The ground begins to shake and my eyes go pale white as I scream into the air. I'm going to fucking rage! I charge at the monster and hit him with everything I have. Your attack is for nothing, as your axe simply bounces off the creature's skin. It growls in a chuckle as it looks down on you. That's fine, I'll get him soon enough. I'll end my turn there. As you do, it will use a legendary action to reach into its sack and pull out its birch switch and strikes you with it, rolling a nat 20, dealing nine slashing damage cut in half and rounded up to five. As a reaction, I cast Hellish Rebuke. Not so fast, Joe. First, I need you to make a constitution saving throw. This will determine whether you can only take a bonus action on your next turn. And you fail the save. On your next turn, you can only use a bonus action. Now, what were you saying about Hellish Rebuke? As a reaction for being damaged, I cast Hellish Rebuke against it. It'll need to make a dexterity saving throw and beat 11, or take 2d10 fire damage. It got a 13, which saves. How much was the damage? It would have been eight, but as it's saved, that's cut in half. That would normally be correct. However, the fire seems to have a greater effect on the creature, and it does take eight fire damage. Oh shit, guys, it's weak to fire. Then you're gonna love what I do next. I use a cantrip to cast Firebolt. It hits. Damn fucking right it does. I scorch this motherfucker with eight fire damage, which I think, if I've got this right, doubles to 16. You are correct, and the beast howls in anger as your firebolt pelts its skin and it burns in agony. Sweet ass, I'll end my turn there. And as you do, the monster will use another legendary action to attempt to grapple you into its sack. Give me a strength or dexterity check. Dexterity all the way, baby. Oh, shit. Your roll is not high enough to secure a save, and as a result, you are stuffed into the monster's sack. You are considered blinded and restrained. How long am I stuck in there? until your team can get you out. I'll get you out. I drop my torch, draw my great sword, and charge at the beast, bringing the full might of the guild down onto it. Your sword merely bounces off the skin of the beast, and it has that same growling chuckle. It swings the sack over its shoulder. Fuck! Drone, try to pierce its sack! I let fly another arrow, aiming at the sack. Then I'll use Horde Breaker to attack a second creature within five feet of the first target, aiming for the beast. Your attack lands and the sack has a small tear. However, your second attack misses the beast. The arrow flies past and it ricochets off the cave wall. I move forward 20 feet and end my turn. The beast surveys each of you and bows its head. Then without warning, it throws its head back and roars tremendously. A hurricane of snow erupts around it and blasts outwards. The three of you need to make a dexterity saving throw. I got 14. I got 12. Same here. Oh, really? And then in which case I am sorry, gentlemen, but you all fail the save and the beast casts this spell at fifth level, meaning you each take 28 cold damage. I'm down. I still have two HP left. I use relentless endurance to stay at one HP. Fuck dude, we should run. You'd leave Donald's character in that sack and mine on the cold ground? Me personally? No, my character in a nanosecond, he's not ready to risk his life for some kids he doesn't know and we're clearly outmatched here. Sorry, dude, but on my next turn, I'm bailing. 
Joe, it is your turn. Remember, you can only use a bonus action this time. I'll drink my potion of healing. Healing for six, bringing me to eight HP, and that'll be me done. Donald, you are stuck inside this sack and cannot do anything on your turn. Worst one shot ever. Rolling for death save, let's go. That's one success. Now, Brock, I believe you said something about bailing? Yep. I'm gonna bounce the fuck out of here. Nothing personal, guys, but given what I've learned about my character, this seems legit for how he would react to this kind of situation. He'll look at the unconscious paladin and shake his head, turn on the spot, and without a word to demon, walk out into the snow. Very well. This leaves a lot down to you, Joe. Good luck. I don't need luck. I've got the power of God and anime on my side. You might just need them. It attempts to gore at you and deals 10 piercing, reduced to five, its second attack. Uh, fuck, its second attack deals 20 piercing, cut in half to 10, which would be enough to knock your character unconscious. It begins that growling cackle as your body hits the ground and it steps over you. It stands on the summoning platform with arrow in its sack and slowly black flames surround its body as it descends into darkness. Wait, what does that mean? It means Arrow has been taken to the Shadowfell and will most likely be devoured by that creature, maybe even violated beforehand. Guys, get your fucking asses up off the ground and summon that thing back. We can't let this end here like that. I'm rolling. Okay, I've stabilized. Guys, I just rolled three under tens. I think I'm dead. There's no way I could fight that thing on my own. My character would have to retreat and get more guild members back here to help. Can I do that? Well, yes and no. Yes, your character can very much head back and gather more members, but that would have to be another one shot for next Christmas as we have sadly come to the end of this year's one. So we lost? Unfortunately so. One party member dead, one ran away. One taken to an unholy hell and only one left badly injured. I'm afraid that is sometimes how D&D works. Not every adventure ends in glory. Sometimes it just ends in shit. Perhaps use this one shot as a lesson for your current campaigns. But it's Christmas Dungeon Master. Can't you do something to help us out? Just because it's Christmas, it doesn't stop bad things from happening. No, this will go down as your first true defeat in D&D. Cherish the moment, learn from your mistakes, and throw away the dice that let you down. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas, and I'll see you again for Tyranny of Dragons, Chapter 2, in January. Until that time, gentlemen, happy holidays and good evening. At least I still have my Christmas gift waiting for me. Merry fucking Christmas, you filthy animals. Hit that subscribe button if you love Christmas, or hate it. Or if you love D&D, or us, or the sky. Or that time you found a dollar on the floor. Fuck it, just subscribe already. The soulless asshole is nearly at 2,000 subs.